y'all today. Thank y'all for coming. Thank y'all for braving the winter wonderland that came in uh, February. Uh, thank y'all for uh, coming and worshiping today, and thank y'all for coming to fellowship with uh, Therefore International with Patty and Joey. So uh, we look forward to hearing from them, both in their testimonies and in the Word. A uh, few quick announcements. There will be no youth either tonight or next week. We will pick up uh, the week after that. And uh, other than that, uh, I don't believe there's anything earth-shaking going on. Uh, if there is anything, a uh, need that anyone has in the congregation, either here or those of you watching over Facebook, uh, call us. Uh, none of us expected weather to be like this, uh, but we will certainly try to help in any possible way we can. So before we go into worship, I want to read this psalm, and that will kind of set our minds and hearts right as we go before the Lord. Psalm 91, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from de de deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. And His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. God, we go before you this morning knowing that in the midst of the craziness of this world and in the craziness of the weather and in the craziness of society, that you are our shield, you are our buckler, you are our rampart, and you are the one in which, which we can put our hope and trust. Thank you for being an unmovable God in the midst of a movable world and a movable society. Uh, be with us this morning as we come before your throne, as we hear testimonies, and as we hear your word. Uh, I ask that everything that's done this morning in this place will be pleasing to you, and we say all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, it's God of grace and God of glory. We're having some um, computer problems this morning. 577. We're going we're gonna to try to get through the first verse of this. God of grace and God of glory. And I mm, hope we know if you, uh, the first verse of it. So. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power, crown thine ancient church's story, bring her but to glorious flower, grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. good you should join the choir when the choir comes back to full strength and uh, we uh, appreciate y'all being here it's good to see y'all and uh, especially under all the conditions and trust that everyone is uh, staying safe at home those who are joining us by uh, internet today thankful for the technology that's available and um, I wanted to share something and, and uh, Rebecca Long is going to hand them out Rebecca and and Deborah Lynch have been serving as co-chairs of our mission team. We have an update from two of our missionaries on a little handout, and she's handing those out. Two of our missionaries, and you'll see one on one side from the uh, Datweilers down in Ecuador. Spoke to Tim and Dana, uh, or to Tim yesterday and, at length, and they're seeing some things come back. Ecuador was hit very hard by the, by the COVID crisis, but now they're starting to see some recovery, and people are, are coming back around. It's given them an opportunity to work on some projects that they weren't able to work on when the regular ministry was going on. But you have an update there from them on one side. And then on the other side, from the Winkle family, they are uh, working with uh, Chinese and Chinese internationals who are in the Memphis area who come to St. Jude. And quite a few uh, come from around the world. And they, with their background, uh, are able to have a special ministry with them. But again, COVID has been a great challenge. And I know that when Joey comes, he'll share something about that as well and how it's impacted the ministries in Ghana. We, next week, we'll have a handout from uh, Share International. Sammy Marimi is sending us a, uh, a report and we haven't received it yet. 
probably because there's no mail this week. But uh, anyway, we'll have that and we'll hand that out next week. They too have been impacted uh, by COVID, by drought, and by torrential rain. And uh, if any of you have ever been in West Texas, when the when the rains come and these flash floods hit, the water hits the ground, it doesn't soak in, it just runs across the top of the ground and it's gone. And they've experienced that uh, in, in uh, Turkana land, Kenya this year, uh, multiple times and it's very, very difficult. They go without water and then they have so much that ground can absorb it and uh, go through cycles like that. But uh, they're doing well and we'll have that handout next week for them. So, uh, Wes, we have another hymn? Take my life and let it be. Listen, another test and see how good we can know it. Take my life and let it be. Consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. It's a blessing to have Patty and Joey Romero with us. They're, uh, I guess, on some kind of a leave or furlough or just stateside for a little while and uh, able to be uh, with us in Ruston, travel through the, through the weather and through the snow to be here, and we're so glad that you're here to hear them. They do not have the difficulties that we have with technology and not having hymnals. When they gather for worship, you can hear it for a long way off when they... Uh, when they have the joy of the Lord in them, it's it's uh, contagious. So good to have you all here. And uh, Joey, come and bring us the word. It is a, a pleasure to be with you guys this morning and uh, have a chance to worship in the middle of what we're in the middle of. And uh, we traveled up from, from Texas and I guess we don't get it as often. I was 12 years old, first time I saw snow. and. Uh, Mama had promised me, because we had heard it was going to snow up here, and she had made a promise to me and said that if it does snow up here, we'll take you out of school and we'll go see it. So man, I was watching the weather. And on the way to school on a Friday morning, we heard that it was snowing in Beaumont, Texas. And Mama refused to take us to Beaumont. After she had promised to take us up here and I was not happy with my mom and uh, about an hour after school started it hit in Port Natchez and they canceled school and I got to go home and be a happy boy and I've forgiven my mama <laughs> but uh, uh, I think after that uh, I don't need any more of it uh, I love to look at it on a, a postcard maybe on the TV uh, but to drive through it and live through it is not it, it's not my pleasure this morning, what I hope to do with you guys is just to give you a brief overview of 2020 and what it was like. Uh, our newsletter, I just made a slide program that's out of that that talks about some of the things that, that we have done uh, and seen done over there. We did get a current update on our language project. We are trying to record the uh, Ewe updated Bible translation in a recording studio so that it can be made available. Some of you may be familiar with the ministry called Faith Comes by Hearing, and uh, that's a great ministry if you're, if you're not currently given to a missions of some kind and you want to, to, to give to something that's a great ministry to be a part of, I can recommend them to you. They are actively recording in audio format and receive that. Once they get the MP3s on their website, you can download them for free. Which means as technology does spread over our world, even those in remote villages now who have access to cell phone towers could download that into their phones and listen to the scriptures. And uh, why is that important for it to be recorded in audio? It's difficult for me and you to connect with that. But here's the reason. The reason for it 
is that the majority of the world uh, doesn't read well. And if they don't have access to the scriptures because they either can't read or can't read well, then it's a very unfortunate situation, but our world has been flooded with false prophets. And if they don't have any way of going to the scriptures and reading those things or listening to the word straight from the scriptures, there's no way they can challenge it. Um, it's becoming even more important for me and you here in the States. In 1957, 58, 59, when my mother and father graduated from high school, they graduated with a vocabulary that ran from 10,000 to 15,000 words. Most high school graduates, that's what they had for a vocabulary. Now it's five to 7,000. So as we become less literate in our nation, technology like this that's making, uh, making it available where people can actually hear the word straight from the scriptures is going to become more and more important. So we are 85% as of February the 1 uh, completed in recording the Elway scriptures in Elway in, uh, in a studio. We're hoping to have that available by July the 1st. Uh, we will be uh, buying little those little tiny chips that you can put in your phone that hold like all the paperwork in the world in that little bitty chip. And we can put those audio recordings and uh, we will distribute those in West Africa. And uh, not just us, uh, we're hoping to get about 3,000 of those. Our ministry is going to partner with others in, in, in distributing that. And uh, I can get that done for $3.28 a chip. And uh, if I do 3,000 of them, it's very, very inexpensive. I can't even go online and buy the chips for that amount, amount of money each and uh, make that available. Yeah, there'll be three translations. There'll be Chi, English, and Elway, all in, in audio on that chip. And uh, so that they can hear it. And what's amazing is they actually take time to do that. Um, it's been fun to see. Uh, even pastors will take those little chips. We can buy these little very inexpensive radios and make those available to our pastors. They can load those little chips in there and listen to the scriptures in their mother tongue. Uh, I've never not had access to that. Uh, I've been reading since I was little. And uh, so it's, it's never been something that was a need for me personally. But when you get a chance to see the light come on because someone's had an opportunity to listen to it in their mother tongue, uh, it's, it's a great blessing. I never will forget a, uh, a Mexican pastor that I was working with uh, in, the, in the East Texas here. He asked me one day, he said, uh, he said Joey, he said, uh, do you know how beautiful John 3.16 is in English. How many of you know how beautiful that passage is in English? And uh, I said, yeah. He said, in, in Spanish, it's heaven. And, it, and the reason it was heaven to him is because that was the language his mama spoke. That was his heart language. And for the same reason it's beautiful to me and you in English, it was beautiful to him in Spanish. And the very first miracle that was ever conducted by the Holy Ghost wasn't the raising of someone from the dead or the feeding of 5,000 on the day of Pentecost. It was making the gospel available in the mother tongues of the people that were there. And uh, uh, which tells me that was the greater work that Jesus talked about in, when he was sharing with his disciples. You're going to even do greater works than these. Well, what was the greater work? The greater work is salvation of humanity through the message of the gospel. And uh, so, uh, having said that, let's look at what's, that wasn't in this report. Um, I'm going to need some glasses. Can y'all, hey, that made it there. Let me tell you, you got a great crew here. They were like, don't have anything working back there. And I said, oh, what's going to happen to my program? He said, we can make that work. And, and they did it. And uh, I don't know how long the table's going to last, but let's see if we can get through this before it collapses. 
Um, we plant churches as part of our ministry, and uh, and to make a short sermon out of that, you don't see any place in the Bible where it calls us to plant churches. It's just not there. There's no command for it. Uh, uh, there's a lot of things that we do and we have in our language as a part of church culture today that you don't see there. But what you do see is the imperative to make followers of Christ. And church is a result of that, obedience to doing that. So if you make disciples, the church happens. And uh, uh, we've been busy doing that kind of work and chasing that kind of work uh, since I've been there. And through that, we've planted uh, over 40 churches. We planted one this last year, a little village called Kwaku Ba. And this is the first baptism. Uh, we did that baptism in September of last year. Uh, Patty was not there. Yeah, were you there for the baptism? No, we did the baptism before you flew in. Uh, I flew out last March, and Patty stayed in Texas to take care of her mama, who was not doing well. Uh, her sisters were engaged in other things for a couple of months. I was due to go back in June for a wedding, and then Patty was going to join me. By that time, her sisters would be back uh, so that she could take care of her mama, and we were going to fly to Ghana together after the wedding. And uh, less than two weeks after I landed in Ghana, the dictator that runs that place shut it all down because of COVID. And uh, I couldn't even travel across the border into another country and have my wife fly in and bring her in. He closed everything. He closed churches. He, any, any meeting that anyone could have with more than a handful of people, he canceled it. Uh, schools, restaurants, church. When he canceled funerals, I knew it was serious because that's basically Ghana's Facebook. That's where all connections are made at funerals. And... Uh, and it was like that for several months. They finally opened the airports up in, uh, I think, September. Um, and restoring flights was uh, uh, was interesting. My wife did get a chance to fly out and, uh, and come see us. Um, by the time she was in the air, but not quite all the way to Ghana, they canceled her flight back to, back to the States <laughs> while she was flying. So... It, even getting back out, you know, the instability in, in that industry is is uh, is frustrating. I know it's frustrating for the airlines also, but um, uh, we planted this church. Here's the baptism. Uh, we just got funding for their roof, uh, for the church structure there. Uh, do you know why they call it a rainforest? Because it rains a lot in those forests, and uh, so if you don't have a something over your head. Uh, it makes it difficult to worship on lots of days. And uh, even when it's not raining, the other problem is you have extremely intense sun uh, uh, on the equator. And if you've got one of these, it makes it even worse. So having that roof over there, rain or shine, is, is a good thing, and that's been funded for Kwaku Ba. Uh, not very far from, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the little church that we worshiped in where you preach that uh, – that last message, I think, when you were there, this is about 20 minutes from there in that same in that same area. Uh, we have a missionary, uh, Jennifer Theriak, who came to Ghana, served for a year and a half, and started making uh, an eyeball romance with the headmaster of our school. And they married, and uh, uh, and they've had a child. This is her baby. And, uh, and the grandma flew over there with my wife to, to see that baby. We see uh, babies being born into Christian families is a really good thing. And uh, so we celebrate that. Uh, there's some more babies that born had one born in my house. Uh, her name is Jejum, which means joy in Ewe. And she has been, she's a little wide body. And, uh, uh, yeah, one on the... The one smiling there, this one. This one is a teacher that we had named Bliss, and uh, she lived in our home for quite a while and uh, uh, ran away from me and got married. And, uh, and uh, here she's had a child, and we celebrate that with her too. She's not in the same area of the country. Uh, photo down below that, uh, a doctor that we've been working with over there that 
is a rarity uh, in that he has a really deep compassion. A lot of the medical profession there is so overwhelmed with needs that the doctors and nurses there somewhere along the line because of being overwhelmed lose that. Uh, God has just anointed the guy to where he hadn't, hadn't lost it. Uh, he loves people. Um, and he's the only eye doctor that serves in an area of about half a million people, which I guess if you wanted to look at it geographically, he's the only doctor for about five parishes the same size as Lincoln Parish. And how many of you are familiar with glaucoma? You know, when you go in for your eye exam and they do that little puff on your eye, uh, they're measuring the pressure in your eye so that they can determine whether or not you have an issue with that. And that issue, by the way, is genetic. So if you have an eye pressure problem, uh, it's similar to a blood pressure problem in that you don't know you have it until you measure it or you die from it. And in the case with glaucoma, the damage caused from the pressure is irreversible. You can stop the progression of it, but you can't recover damage once it's already done. Well, a lot of blindness in my area. I mean, bunches of it. And this doctor, uh, I started doing some research. He didn't have an instrument to measure eye pressure with. And guess where the epicenter for glaucoma is in the world? Ghana, West Africa. It's the highest percentage of glaucoma blindness on the planet. And he was serving not only in the nation that was the epicenter of that, he was serving as an eye doctor in the epicenter for glaucoma in Ghana without something to, to measure pressure with. I got the, uh, that information back. We got a ministry partner in Houston. And uh, he and his wife, when they retired, made it a mission. Now think about Houston. There's 5 million people there to put eyeglasses on every child that couldn't afford them so they could learn in school. It took him five years to do it. He built a team, got with Walmart and some other sponsors and that kind of thing, and they did it. Uh, so he's, he, he was, he's very interested in that kind of ministry, and he heard about this need and just wrote us a check, and we bought a, uh, uh, I forget what, tonometer. That's the name of the instrument. Uh, he's got one in his office that's mounted uh, on his desk, and he's got a portable one. That was the expensive one that he can go and do portable clinics with us. He's done two of those since we brought him that instrument, identified 16 glaucoma uh, patients. The medication is very cheap there. He'll be able to stop whatever, whatever uh, progression was coming. And uh, the other thing he looks for is, of course, you know, if someone does come to him blind, and uh, is there a way to, to help with that? And really about the only blindness that you can reverse consistently is blindness caused by cataracts. And he was doing a clinic for us in, um, in school, and I heard him exclaim. He was, he was examining an elder lady that had been brought to him uh, from two miles away. She walked with her grandchild leading her uh, to the clinic, and she was completely blind. And he exclaimed out loud, the most absolutely beautiful cataracts. I can solve it. <laughs> and uh, uh, a little girl did an ice cream sale in San Diego, California area, uh, on two different weekends and raised enough money to pay for her cataract surgeries. So, you know, God connects the dots and, uh, and, and, and it's still working to restore sight to the blind. The little boy to the, to the right of that doctor uh, his mother gave birth to him, club foot, and women have no voice. In particular, poor women have no voice. And uh, meaning you can't connect unless you can speak. So she had no access to finding someone that could solve her son's problem. And he was almost a year old. And for those of you who may know about that particular uh, deformity, uh, it needs to be treated almost immediately. And if it's not, it becomes more and more difficult to manage. And uh, 
He was a twin. So they came to us, and my wife, who is just a bulldog when it comes to trying to find help for situations like that, got him connected to a doctor in a ministry that did that surgery for $75. And uh, uh, yeah. yeah. He had been through the surgery and done the brace thing for about a year and a half, I think it was, and she brought him to our porch, and we had a chance to celebrate watching him walk. Isn't that cool? And uh, uh, and then below that is our water ministry. We've done several hundred of these, and uh, uh, bringing water to uh, people who don't have access to it. And uh, we do a gospel presentation at the dedications where we do this called Clean Hands and Clean Hearts. It teaches hygiene and relates the need to having clean hands with the need for us to have a clean heart, which there's only one way to get one. And it's through Jesus and our trust and, and giving of ourselves to him. And uh, he's, he's the only source for righteousness. And uh, so he grants that to those that understand their need for it. And, uh, and we make that message available. Um, how many of you try things occasionally in life that don't work, but you thought they would before you did it? Do you know missionaries do that a lot? And uh, we have things that we see problems. I'm one of those guys that likes to look at things critically and, and, uh, and it, uh, identify the problem in an effort so I can do what? So I can fix it. And uh, uh, there's lots of problems around us. They're around you every day. They're around me and, and my wife as we serve in West Africa. And ladies who want to send their children to school have to go to their husband for money for that. And if there's a choice in between buying the uniform for that child to go to school and him buying a new funeral cloth to wear to the next funeral, he buys the cloth. There's tremendous pressure. We can judge that if, you, if we want to and say, you know, which, why don't you teach the guy different? Uh, how many have noticed it's difficult to change things in a rural community in North Louisiana? You noticed that? Yeah, you've noticed that. And uh, I've taken note of it, too. And multiply the difficulty of making change happen in a rural community in, in, in North Louisiana by maybe 10 times or more. And that's how big of a struggle it is to, to change things in a rural community in the third world. Tradition is their strength. Asking them to leave it is like asking them to leave everything that makes them strong. And the pressure on this guy to buy that funeral cloth is immense. Uh, if he doesn't do it, he'll be hounded. So where does that leave the wife who wants to see her daughter learn how to read? You know, she's got to find a way to do that. And we look to see if we can provide employment uh, in different ways. Uh, we've had some of that fail and some of it succeed. Our first success was our, was our tailoring school. And that has given some of the ladies, uh, we graduated a group, you'll see the picture I think on the next slide, and this last year we opened a bread plant at our school. And let me tell you, I thought if there's ever going to be a failure, it's going to be this. Because we started the bread after COVID shut down everything. Well, who are we going to sell it to? You know, there's nobody in the markets and it's going to have to be done uh, on headpans by ladies going and traveling from, from, from village to village in the rural area. I mean, it's, it's oh, maybe, maybe it'll work. So we baked 75 kilograms of flour our first day. Uh, it's roughly 2.2 pounds per kilogram, if that helps you do the math. And uh, so a, a little bit more than double, 160 uh, pounds of flour. And they baked that at night. We had it all done by about 7 o'clock in the morning. 4 o'clock that afternoon, it was all sold. And uh, so, I mean, I'm looking at, if it's doing that good during the time when the economy's, I mean, closed, uh, where could we go with this? So 
I made co communication back to the states. We needed to have a way to, to uh, mix the dough there in the village in a timely manner and a bigger. So I got the funding for that and uh, uh, went to this guy who makes things out of whatever he can find. And they made me a dough mixture out of a, uh, the gearbox, uh, rear end gearbox, off of an old Mercedes Benz dump truck. And yeah, that's that's here. That's the bowl. It'll mix uh, a bag and a half, or it'll mix 75 kilograms of flour at one time. And he took the axles off of it, heated them, and bent them, and that made the kneaders. And uh, we hooked it up to an eight and a half horsepower uh, single piston diesel engine out of India. And if you see it running, you'll want to run too away from it. And uh, it, it might, you, if you look at it going, you, you, you think maybe it might kill someone. But it's been doing the job and hasn't killed anyone yet. And uh, uh, we have a, a, a big roller to roll the dough uh, after we get it mixed. And I think I talked to Vincent last week. It takes them about two and a half weeks now to sell a ton of flour baked. And uh, uh, that's a metric ton. Hmm? We're making a, a sweet bread is the number one seller. It's got just enough sh sugar in there for you to be able to taste it. And the second best seller is a, uh, a butter bread. And uh, the third best seller is a tea bread, which has got only enough sugar in it for, to grow the yeast. And, uh, and then we have a, uh, well, no, the, the, the chocolate bread. It's a swirl with, with chocolate in it, and it's really good. And, uh, and now they, they're doing wheat bread. And we want to introduce French bread to them because farmers are buying this in the morning, and they'll take a, a, a jug of water, and they'll put that bread in their pocket, and you know that French bread, I don't know if you've ever been to Spain or France and eaten it from over there, but it's not, it's harder even than what you buy here for the most part. My dad met me over in Spain. He said, I don't know whether to eat this or hit somebody with it. And uh, he said, these people don't know how to do bread. But I know that that kind of bread would serve us really good in, uh, uh, in the farming community for those guys that are going out there. It'll hold up better in the pocket and, uh, than soft breads. Uh, we do the baking in a, in a clay oven. Um, we built a small one to start with, and that worked, but it's not big enough. And again, God has just blessed our ministry, even in the middle of COVID. We had funding come in for, uh, for that new bigger oven, which will be twice the size of the one we have, and help us to, to do a better job of baking. But the way that works is they build a, a clay platform, and then a dome over the top of it. It's just got a big hole in the side. And we collect firewood from the forest around us. And uh, they put it in there and light it. And after the fire burns down to ashes, they rake the ashes out of there, put the bread in, and cover the hole up. And the residual heat from the clay is what actually does the baking. And so that oven can bake uh, about three batches on one firing. And then you have to add a little bit more uh, wood to it to bring the temperature up a little bit to, to continue it. And uh, it's been interesting to watch it. And I'm surprised I don't weigh 1,000 pounds because it's right there close to my house. And I can smell that bread every time they make it, you know, and I like bread. So uh, it, it's been a battle uh, not to eat too much of it. I bought this three-wheel uh, thing uh, from China for almost nothing and thought I got a really good deal. It cost us about $100 every time we start it and uh, to keep it going. But it is helping us distribute the bread. Uh, what I didn't, what I anticipated with the bread is if, if we did the best, we might employ somewhere between, oh, let's say six and 10 or 12 uh, ladies right there and we, they also take apprentices, so we have some of the young ladies that finish uh, junior high but will not go to high school. They'll come and learn how to make that bread so they can make money. Uh, what I didn't understand was that almost all of our bread was going to wholesale. I thought we would be retailing it, and that is not the case. 
group. So we have ladies, multiple ladies, that are our sales staff. And uh, they come for the bread. Uh, we sell them 60 Ghana CDs at retail for 50 Ghana. So their profit when they sell that bread is 10 Ghana CDs, which is about $1.80. Some of them will walk three to four miles, get that bread in the morning, and then go back to their area and sell it in that area. And by the evening time or maybe the next day, they'll have to sell again. If they do that twice a week, they got enough money for malaria meds for one of their children. They got enough money in two weeks to have a uniform for their daughter to go to school with. And uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is we hit a home run with this one. So having you guys here to hear about and celebrate that with us is, is a good thing. Um, we call the bread uh, a true bread. We branded it uh, from John 6 uh, where Jesus says, you know, you've heard about the bread uh, that came down from heaven and uh, the manna. That's not the true bread. I'm the one that's the true bread. That's a rough Joey translation of what Jesus says there. And uh, so we named our bread after that and uh, got it all over our little three-wheel three, uh, trike there. This is our uh, sewing school. Uh, we had sponsorships, and basically the way this school worked um, we have a, a master tailor and seamstress, and uh, she's certified in the country to be that. And she can take apprentices, and they work for her, uh, not for pay, but for skills, in exchange for skills. And our ministry's connection to that uh, was their classroom was set up at the school, and we fed them every day. So if you're given to child partnership, uh, you're a part of this. And I got sponsors for the sewing machine and for their exams. Uh, hand crank sewing machines. Anybody ever seen one of those? Do you know they manufacture them by the thousands? That's the main machine that sews garments in the third world is that uh, butterfly singer sewing machine looking thing uh, out of China. And we provided the machines for them uh, with the understanding that they had to maintain it. So if they broke it, they're the ones that have to, to pay to have it fixed. We bring in a mechanic that comes in, you know, once every two or three months, and he services the machines, and they pay them out of their pockets. And, uh, and their husbands allow them to come to this because they're not having to travel to town. And you say, well, why can't they travel to town for it? Because if they're not there in the morning, they can't fetch their husband's bath water. They can't cook for him. And when you're married over there, that's the instructions you're going to be given. Those are your responsibilities. And if there's any problem with that, the husband can go back to the family and say, my wife's not doing this and that, and they'll correct it. That's the culture there. So she can't travel into town for training. Uh, she has to stay close to home. That school in that rural community give some of those ladies access. Their husbands will allow them to attend that because they can get their uh, duties for him done before they start school in the morning. And uh, the apprenticeship is three years. At the close of three years, they go through a three-day examination by an outside master who's brought in, and uh, they identify all the skills that this each one needs to be able to perform in order to be deemed a master. And they demonstrate those different skills during the three days. And if they do that at a level uh, that's considered uh, to be a master level, then they're certified and they can go out and make apprentices themselves. What do we see in the scriptures? Uh, they started every day with song and prayer. And uh, we taught them in the middle of this how to read. And some of them resisted that. I came here for sewing, and now you're making me learn how to read. You'll like the fact that we did that after you know how. And uh, <laughs> so, but we, we had some fun with that. And uh, uh, another one of our home runs. 
And if you want to talk about our failures, we can do that afterwards. <laughs> We've had some of those. Um, Oh, we, grad, we, we started with 10 students, and uh, by the way, if they maintain that machine and they complete and become the master, uh, we inspect the machine, make sure it's properly the master that comes and does the examining, inspects their machines also, and if they are certified as masters, they get to take the machine with them. That's, that's the deal. And uh, so we started with 12 students, and we actually certified tw 10 of them. So we, we, had a, we had a really, I think, successful program. And uh, they're, that's the ladies that are graduating. We had a big celebration. It was lots of fun. Uh, are y'all schools up here doing in-person school? Are y'all virtual or both? A little bit of combination. Uh, when they shut down schools there, I mean, there was none of that. I mean, <laughs> you don't have access to virtual in Ghana. And uh, so I've got a house full of kids there. And I hired two of our teachers who didn't have jobs. And uh, uh, by the way, we don't fund teachers there from Americans. So if, if you're giving a child partnership with Therefore, your money does not go to pay them. Uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, your money is, is, is supporting food and infrastructure at the school. Because if we're funding the salaries of the teachers, from the states and that money ever gets cut off for any reason the school closes and uh, but if they can't eat because the funding gets cut off they can still learn and uh, and have food provided for locally so there's a reason for that plus it gives the families there some investment personal stake in what's taking place and we have learned even in in extreme poverty if personal investment is not demanded it doesn't work it needs to happen and uh, so we've done that, and uh, uh, I had those teachers. We approved an emergency. Our board approved uh, for your contribution to child partnership to provide half pay for our teachers while they weren't teaching. And uh, so we paid them to not be there uh, to try to help, help them survive. And, uh, but the other thing that it did Almost no private schools in Ghana uh, did that, and almost every one of them lost all their teachers. They had to go somewhere to find a way to make it. And uh, uh, our teachers have over and over and over and over thanked us for, oh, thank you, Daddy, for considering us. You know, and uh, we lost one teacher in the Volta region. We've lost uh, uh, no teachers in, in Kutai, not one. They all came back. And we just started school about two or three weeks ago. Uh, he, the president let us come back. But my kids in the, in the house, we had school in the house during that whole time period. And uh, this is my little girl, Jolie. And uh, we wanted to make it official. So I had uniforms sewn for them so they could attend the school in my house. And uh, that way they would know it was official. And they're showing off their uniforms here on that day. And after school is over with, you know, she gets out of her uniform and, running around in her panties, and uh, it's hot there, and uh, I'm, I'm just happy she had those on, and, uh, and but she was bringing me her A's, and that's a picture of her A's, and she, she said, Papa, I did my ABCDs today, and uh, she's excited about uh, having a chance to learn how to read and write. We did eventually have a graduation. The government allowed our uh, graduating students to come back and study long enough to take their finals, and we had a graduation for them from junior high. This is me performing a wedding there uh, uh, with a, a girl that's basically was raised in our house after she was older and uh, the mother of Jolie and Jejum. Um, this is us having worship on my front porch with some of the kids in my house. And right below that, you may not be able to figure out what they've got, but this is mushroom season. And uh, some of you may not be fungus eaters, but I'm one of them. And uh, I enjoy a good mushroom, and these are some of the best. And the only way you can farm them is to have a termite that does it. They have tried and tried and tried and tried to figure out a way to, uh, to produce these in a way uh, commercially. But God is the only one who has given the skill, and he gave it to a termite. And these mushrooms grow in that particular termite's mound. It's uh, only one type of termite. 
that grows them. And they're, they come from about, I don't know, first week in February through maybe the end of April, you'll be able to get them. And my kids knew we love them, and they had gone out and harvested them, and there they are presenting their harvest. And uh, we were excited. Some of you may remember a story I wrote years ago called Shower to You um, uh, about my daughter and her relationship to a special boy in our village. Uh, he, his, his goal in life is to find someone that he can love and share joy with. That's just what he did. And uh, he's got a twin brother that's probably six foot two, handsome, strong young man, and then Eche. And Eche's incontinent. Uh, There's no treatment for that there. So you can imagine the smell and the heat. And my daughter came to serve there for a year and a half, and, and she and those people find my daughter. It's just she makes a connection. And Eche found her, and they had a, a great relationship for a year and a half, and during that time period, I never saw her rejected. Can you imagine being a boy that wants to share love and joy with anybody that is willing, and he smells so bad no one will come close? And then you find someone that will allow it. And uh, But if the flies were thick and the smell was really bad, he only got a side hug. <laughs> but when... He longed for a full embrace. He would take his bucket. He would go to the well in front of my house and fill that bucket up and bathe himself. And before he could smell bad again, he would come to my daughter and say, Classy, shower to you. So it was his, it was, it was his gift to her, you know. And, uh, and she would allow him to bury his head, you know, in her chest and just hold him for as long as he wanted to be held. And uh, those uh, folks have a real struggle living long life. He, uh, our urinary systems are sterile and designed to be closed. His was open. So he suffered from repeated and ongoing kidney infections, and he died from failure, kidney failure, uh, about two weeks after I flew out. In November, and uh, this is his picture. He's holding a picture of uh, that my daughter had sent him, and uh, laminated. And he has that. And this is, are you ready? Dun, 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 dun. Henry David Romero. It's my grandson. It has nothing to do with the mission in Ghana, but because you're here and I've been celebrating a new grandson, I thought you would be happy to do that with me this morning. And uh, we can talk about that for another 10 minutes, but we won't. Uh, having a great time. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, ask any questions before we go to God's Word for a little short period, and then we'll dismiss our service. Anybody have any questions? Agnes is doing fine. She's working uh, uh, and would be here if she wasn't. Uh, she's uh, a caretaker for an elderly lady that lives in our neighborhood, and uh, she just had surgery. She had a spinal cord stimulator. Uh, I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, and, uh, but it's, it's really helping her sleep. She's still having some pain with it, and uh, uh, she's working extremely hard to get her uh, GED equivalent. Uh, Agnes didn't attend any school at all until she was 13, so she's trying to catch up and trying to learn in a second language, which is uh, not the easiest especially when you're having to take morphine at night in order to survive. And, and Ativan, which is a memory stealer, you know, and, and uh, so she learned her math and passed the test, and the next day she didn't know any of it. And, you know, so that's, that's been a real struggle. So if she can get off those drugs with this uh, spinal cord stimulator, it's really going to help her. And uh, we're hoping that that's going to be the case. She's only had to take morphine three times since she had it installed. She's had it for three weeks, four weeks. Yeah, end of January, so uh, it's already making an impact. And the times that she had to take morphine, she had to take it one dose. And, uh, and that's just, yeah. When she has her pains, when you look at her, you just can't 
picture it, but it, they're so severe she screams. And there's just not much that can be done. Um, there's one injection that we can use to stop it, and it takes a while to do that. And uh, uh, it's a real strong non-narcotic, but it's real hard on your liver and, and kidneys, so we didn't like doing that. But that's a, that's a long story. She's doing better. She's doing a lot better. Any other questions? 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. Robert Frost wrote a poem, lots of them, and one that has stayed with me is a real short one that he wrote. I love his poetry, and it's called Fire and Ice. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think uh, I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. The question that he is putting in front of us there is about the destruction of the world. Will it end in passion or will it end in hatred? Will it, will it, will, will it be uh, destroyed in love or will it be in destroyed in hatred? I think we're still there. I think we're seeking to find an answer to that question. And there are prophets on YouTube, in Christian pulpits, in political pulpits, uh, name your place, who are looking at mine and yours need to have that question fulfilled based on the ills we have in front of us every day. Scripture is something I go to. Because when I turn on YouTube and I'm listening to a guy there that may be smarter than me or I turn on the TV and I'm trying to discern whether this politician is examining things the way they should be and has critically looked at the situation and is offering policies that's going to solve the issue that's in front of me, I don't know whether they're telling the truth. I really don't. And maybe you have great trust in what you're hearing in those things, but I, I just don't have it. But when I pick this up, I, I don't have any questions about whether or not truth is here. And it's not partial truth, it's complete truth. It's not true in one place and false in another place. It's, it's, it's solid. So Peter, during the time that he's writing, is facing a world not unlike ours in that the people of that day are seeing the problem, and in particular it's the church that he's addressing. And in this last chapter of his second letter, he opens by saying, this is now, let me put my cheaters on so I can do this better. Verse 1 in 2 Peter chapter 3. This now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you in which I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of our Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. He's telling them that I'm fixing to tell you something you've already heard. And what you've already heard, you heard it from the prophets. So that's the Old Testament prophets, that's, this is our our 8th and ninth century prophets. This is Moses. And he's saying, and our Lord, you've also heard it from him. And not just from the prophets and the Lord, but the apostles are giving you the same message. So I'm going to bring us back to that 
and that's, you know, one of the most important reasons that we meet together. It's not because we want to see something new. It's because we need to be reminded. And he's acknowledging to the church, I'm fixing to remind you some things you've already heard. But maybe you haven't heard lately. Now, back when I went to how to be a preacher school, one of the things that they try to do is to help you take this book and glean from it the places you need to emphasize. And one of the things that they told us to look for is things that are repeated multiple times. There's something Peter's going to repeat three times in the next ten verses. Let's read them and see what they are. So we'll know what Peter is trying to remind them and then us this morning of. Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is this promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. He's reminding them that... God, the creator who formed everything through water, was capable of using that same water to bring about its destruction. And then he did so because of the utter wickedness that man had brought to the creation that he put them in. And some of you may remember the story and the account of, of how things had increased and before the flood. Only one righteous man could he find was Noah. Me and you are the result of God saving that man from that destruction. Saved through water. It's reminding him of that. Don't forget, God has destroyed the earth. <coughs> but, by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. Peter, Isaiah, Jesus, John answers the question for me and you, it's not going to end in ice. It will end in fire. Robert Frost need not be confused about how this is going to happen because Scripture has answered that for us. <clears throat> but do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord's not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Why has it not been destroyed by fire if it's reserved for that? Peter gives us a reason. The full number of the Gentiles has not come in. The scriptures tell us Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 verse 14 talked about all of the things that we fear. He said you're going to see those things. There's going to be wars. There's going to be rumors of wars. There's going to be uh, earthquakes, there's going to be people who will come and say, I'm the Savior, vote for me and we'll make America great again. Vote for me and we'll restore the heart of democracy. Can you save a country destined for fire? How many of you have ever been in a barn? I mean a really big one, especially at the end of hay season. And it's just stacked from wall to wall. There's almost, I mean, the only real thing you can do in that barn is walk down the middle of it. Maybe. What's the last thing you want to see when you're in that barn? Is a match. Do you know why? 
once dry grass gets started, you can call all the fire trucks in Louisiana. You are not going to put that fire out. Folks, we're living in a big hay barn here. God's got the match. And when the full number of me and you and the nations of the world and every tongue have been brought in, God will throw the match. That's what he was telling me and you. So, what is positive about this message? You know, we're taught to be positive people. Can we positive about our barn if it's headed for destruction? Well, maybe. Let's look at where Peter brings us to at the end of this. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. That's the second time he's hit the nail, the same one. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming day of the Lord? Because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intensity. He says the third time he's hit the same nail. He's trying to drive this home to the reader that this creation is going down. What's your issue, church? That's what he's saying to me to do, me and you today. You look into the world that's fallen, and we have so many things that become our passion. Do we not? Making America great again, maybe that's your passion. Do you know that in the day of Peter and Jesus, the apostles, were looking forward to the day the kingdom would be restored to Israel. And the king, they were convinced, was standing there in front of them, risen, having put death to death, having conquered sin, having raised the dead, and now they are absolutely 100% convinced this is the king that will restore Israel. And they ask him the question, is it not at this time that you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Waiting with anticipation for him to say, let's go and kick Rome's To make Israel great again. And Jesus' response must have been somewhat disappointing. Because in a nutshell, what he says there in the first chapter of Acts is, that's none of your business. My Father in heaven has set the time for that. It's his business. But he didn't stop with, that's none of your business. He gave them what their business was. And this was the business. You wait for power of the Holy Ghost to come upon you. And you be my witnesses. Share the gospel with every city, even the people you hate in Samaria to the utter ends of the world. So Peter in this chapter tells us that we should be looking for and hastening the coming day of the Lord. In the Olivet Discourse, Jesus says a lot of things are going to be in front of you to make you afraid. Don't pay attention to that. It's not the end. First, the kingdom the gospel must be preached to all nations, and then the end will come. So if we want to hasten the day, and I'm ready to hasten the day, and I'll tell you why. 
I struggle against my flesh every moment I breathe. Saving me from my sin did not eliminate my lusts. Did not eliminate the fact that I walk in war against those things. Greed. Pride. All the things that lead man to want to be in control of who his God might be reside in me. And if you're honest with yourself, they also reside in you. And when the coming kingdom comes, guess what? He makes me righteous. I don't have that body anymore. That war is done with. I'm ready for the kingdom to be restored. Not because it makes America great again or makes Israel great again, but because the kingdom that will be. Let's read about it in verse 13. But accounting, but according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Righteousness will dwell there. What's your issue? Make America great? Racial injustice? In Luke chapter 9, verse 53, you don't have to go there, but if you have a chance, there's a little scripture there that basically says, from this point, Jesus set his face to Jerusalem. I think it's interesting. So basically from that verse in Luke, we know that Jesus was single-mindedly focused on a first thing. Does that make sense? My son preached a message several years ago that I've never forgotten. And he was talking to me about that message. And he said, Daddy, he said the reason the scriptures try to get us to focus on first things is because when we make good second things our focus, we forget the first things. And when we forget the first things, we lose both first things and second things. We lose it all. So, Peter is reminding me and you this morning, yes, there are good things to be chasing and trying to do better and fix, if you will. Is it wrong for America to be great? No, not at all. But to make that our primary focus is wrong. You can't save a burning home. But what you can do is share the gospel so that those who live in the barn don't get caught throwing water on the fire they can't put out in front of their eyes. What do you do with a message like this? How do you respond to that if you're listening to it? Let me make a couple of suggestions for me and you both to consider. The issue that's important to you, whatever it may be, is probably a very important thing. Is it better to try to fight that with the world? Or is it better to fight that with the gospel? What is the real weapon? that needs to be used in the war against what's wrong? Could it be that Jesus chose the right weapon when he set his face to Jerusalem and gave his life that those like me and you caught up in a fallen world 
my love in a world yet to come that is righteous. If that be the case, the next question is, are you willing to engage the world with that gospel? That may require some change. Because in the world we live in, for you to do that might cost you your job. Might cost you your friends. Might cost you even your church. But it might save the one you love so that they don't burn up in the barn. What of love? Will the world end in fire or will it end in ice? Could our lack of passion for addressing the world's ills with the gospel, could that be defined as ice of hatred toward our enemies? I think so. Let us address it with the gospel. This church, for several years, uh, has been such a tremendous blessing to not just, therefore, uh, me and my wife and family, but to Sammy. And those pastors uh, in, in East Africa, to the Dot Wallers who are struggling to even be on the field. And Patty and I need to get an injection before we can go. And I'm in the queue for that, but I'm 59. So they're not calling me. You know, So we have circumstances that we need help with by prayer. Uh, the Winklers, they are ministering to Chinese that come here from a country who kills Christian pastors. And they're coming to our country for education. They're coming to tech. They need the gospel. And your church has been supporting those things. Some of you have been made faith promises over the years. Uh, an opportunity today for you to consider your faith promise is right now. And uh, do we have those cards? Have we passed those out already? Do people have them? Do you have one of these? Yeah, can you pass those out? And the way this church has been doing this, and I don't know the percentages, but I know the, the mission committee here has divided up faith promise giving in between internationals and local ministries. Uh, if you'll look on the back here, you've got several Christian community action. Uh, I don't know how if I'm saying this right. Desiard? Desiard? Uh, Street Shelter, uh, Louisiana Methodist Children's Homes right here close to us, uh, Life Choices, Teen Challenging, uh, Wesley Foundation here at Tech. All of these ministries are being supported by your church through faith promise that's given above your tithe and your offering. So when you commit to give here, your church is faithful to take that giving and divide it up on a percentage basis uh, between all of those ministries. So, therefore, is only one part of your reach into the world with the gospel through these ministries. And I want to encourage you to uh, take a look at this, to pray about your participation. Uh, one of the things that's been a tremendous encouragement to me and my wife is we attend church, a different church, for the last several weeks, almost every, well, every Sunday. And the attendance at every church, with the exception of one, is down. Uh, our attendance in our churches in Ghana is probably half of what it was before COVID. So we're all struggling with that, but people are giving. Uh, uh, it, it's been, I watch it, I mean, every week I've got someone calling me that's sending help so God's mission can continue in spite of the fact that we're limited in our fellowship uh, by, this, by this disease. 
the love that God has given all of us is still in the hearts of the people that are in His church. That's encouraging. And uh, so don't be discouraged because you're looking at this sanctuary and you don't see a lot of people that you would like to see. Uh, God is still doing that work. And be encouraged to fill this thing out and turn it in. Uh, are we going to do that today? Or are they come? How do they do that? I think, given the circumstances that we don't have a lot of pens in the pews, and uh, how many people are prepared to do this, if you're ready to do it today and you fill it out, we want to encourage you to do that. Just leave it in the basket, or this is a good time to, to bring it and place it on the altar if you're going to have to worship it. That's an excellent way to dedicate Amen. yourself and trust in God to make a difference. And if you're not ready to do it, you may not have a pen to do it with. We can provide that, but you may need to be in prayer, in conversation with family. That's okay, too. But just we encourage you to do it. You heard how vital it is, how important it is to the ministries around the world and here in this community. So we just want to encourage you. And I know that God has set some hearts today for uh, the ministry. We do want to leave um, before we close the service just a, a check that uh, represents what we do. Uh, we were able to do the year generosity of the people of Grace, about twenty thousand dollars. They have been real faithful to do that for us. And uh, we also have a clipboard here. If you're not on our mailing list and you would like to be on our mailing list or you have been and you switched emails and we, we need an update, that kind of thing, this is here. And uh, I'll just, I think Nick's already gone on our list. And you guys may be. You can pass it around. And I forgot something. And if I don't do this, my mama is going to be hard to, to, to see when I see her next time. Uh, my mother went to... Jerusalem, oh. <laughs> and she got this from Jerusalem, which is a uh, shofar, and they use it to announce worship. Anybody in here toot a horn? Uh, this has got a real small mouthpiece, so if you've played maybe like a French horn, you'll be able to, to make the noise, And uh, but she wanted me to present this at the church meeting to your music leader, and that's you. Today. Today. For today, so uh, yes, sir. All right, all right. Um, let me close this in prayer, and I'll be around. I'm going to be. I think me and wife are, are, are probably going to stay in North Louisiana through tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon, and uh, if we're given reasons to stay longer, we'll do that. We just haven't been up here in a while. I'd like to visit some of my family. If any of you need a visit uh, on a more personal level than this morning, uh, we're available for that. Uh, just give me a call. Uh, message me on Facebook. So uh, let me pray with us. And are we going to do a closing song, or is that pretty much a closing song? We'll do that. Father in heaven, we thank you so much this morning for the message that you have brought to our ears and our heart. May we take these things you have given us, these gifts, and leave here in a different way than we came in to live life in such a way that spreads the gospel to a lost world. In Jesus' name, amen. Closing hymn is Go Make of All Disciples. Make of all disciples, we hear the call, O Lord. Go make of all disciples, we hear the call, O Lord, that comes from thee, our Father. It's from thee, our Father, in thy eternal word. Eternal word.
learn a word, inspire our ways of learning, inspire our ways of learning. Through earnest, fervent prayer, earnest, fervent prayer, and let our daily living reveal Thee everywhere. Let's stand for the benediction. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your word, for your eternal word that is truth, that will guide us as we look to you. Now you've laid that word upon our hearts. Let our lives and our, our giving of ourselves, of our resources, of our gifts, of our talents, of our time reflect the priority that you have placed before us to spread your word to each and every person, man, woman, and child. We give you thanks for your word, and we give you thanks for those who carry it and that you give it to each and every one of us to be your carriers and your missionaries, your spokespersons, your speakers throughout this world. Guide our lips and guide our walk this week that we may reflect you through Christ our Lord, we pray. And let all God's people say, Amen. Now, remember, God loves you. We love you. Stay the course. <laughs>